this is a forgery. For the real thing, come to the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. Two, three, how do you organize uh, all the different types of medical instrumentations, etc., that you show? The first book, volume one, was basically uh, the instrumentation, mm -hmm. um, showing the basic instruments that the surgeons used. Uh, I had so many things trying to be pawned off to me and other, there was a couple other collectors, medical stuff, that weren't Civil War. The, the biggest thing that came to me, I was at a show in, I think, Gettysburg or somebody that comes up, and he said, well, I got some Civil War sutures for you. You want to buy them? I said, well, let's see them. And they got a big red cross on them, number one, and they say <laughs> cat gut, and then they say sterile. And I said, sir, let's get the story right. There was no sterility known in the Civil War. They didn't use cat gut sutures and things like that. So it, basically the first volume was to get the instrumentation out show what a uh, capital amputation saw was, what was a uh, amputation scalpel and the different type of instrumentation. In the second volume we went in to talk more about the surgeons and we talked about well my favorite guy Letterman and we talked about some of the other Union surgeons and also the Confederates, uh, Preston Moore who was the Surgeon General of the Confederate Army which did a, he had a heck of a job to do starting from zero and he did a nice job down there and they had their counterparts to, to Letterman such as Lafayette Guild who I'm trying to do some research to on now and uh, some other surgeons that they used uh, and then the third volume was just a compendium of all that and then I got some uh, items from a fellow collectors of mine that were bogus and then mm -hmm. we got to the final chapter and said this is what you look out for when you when you go mm -hmm. so somebody tried to sell you a, a bogus piece of equipment did here we're talking in shauna's book about how knowledge medical knowledge increased during the war did instrumentation change at all in some aspects not really the instrumentation it's been there for hundreds the saw, of years. A saw, a saw, a saw, a saw, a <laughs> saw. Mm -hmm. You know, a few years ago we were talking before we started here that uh, I did a, a, a display at a Civil War show called Amputation Now and Then. Mm -hmm. And I went to my orthopedic surgeon friend and got all the amputation tools that he uses in a modern a amputation. And then I had my civil, I mean, had them in the same cabinet. And people said, oh, that's a amputation saw. Well, here's an amputation saw. What's the difference? This is all stainless steel can be sterilized under heat and pressure where the Civil War one has an ebony handle or an ivory handle and they didn't sterilize material but, but a, a clamp uh, teneculum uh, suture material back then was silk and the Confederates used horsehair sometimes but now we use sterile suture material resorbable absorbable material so it, an amputation is still a removal of a piece of the body but some of the more intricate things that they were finding. I, I, I'm doing this from no knowledge. So uh, more intricate surgeries perhaps that they were finding that they could do certain things during the war with medical knowledge that they have to get certain instrumentation to be able to perform what they were doing. Well, it, my particular interest was actually the microscope because there were so few physicians that were actually familiar with the instrument based on their records and, and using it as a matter of practice. Most physicians had home laboratories and if they owned a microscope, and a lot of the elite physicians did, they would own an Oberhauser or a Roisis and they would bring them with them from uh, Paris or Vienna, which, which is where many of the elite studied prior to the war. Well, in 1863, all of a sudden you start to see letters um, in re record group 112 at the National Archives requesting microscopes. And it's letter after letter after letter, there's hundreds of them in this record group to Hammond saying, I promise if you'll issue me a Surgeon General's microscope, they issued a Zentmeyer, that I will use it for the benefit of science. It'll help me figuring out what's causing these diseases, but also in diagnosis. And there's, you know, one after the other. And they don't issue many, but what does happen is, is a, a few physicians start to order their own. So physicians that had never used the instrument or thought about using the instruments started to order their own. And also the Surgeon General issued um, microscopes to some of the general hospitals and more interestingly um, they uh, Joseph Woodward who's curator of the medical section of the Army uh, Medical Museum puts together a beautiful series of photo micrographs beginning in later 1864 but then through the 60s and 70s and this is all of a sudden looking at the inside of the body and it's talking about diseases in a way that many had not before the war so you start to see 
microscopy and even debates about seeing what are we looking at and what what's happening here so the same debates that you see going on in Europe are now happening in the war so it's a it's a it's a very different way to think about disease which was kind of interesting you mentioned quickly the south and yours is a northern book basically it's really the yeah. story of what happened in the north uh, through both of your experiences how how about the south here uh, we picked up recently a wonderful journal of hospital life uh, in the Army of Confederate Army of Tennessee by Kate Cumming, and it's a it's a pretty good book. Mm -hmm. uh, and others I know, uh, Montiero is another one from the South who produced uh, a journal of what he, he went through. She certainly did, and talking about life in the Southern Army. Did the Southern Army have different medical care than the North? Did they find uh, knowledge increasing in the South as well? Were they, even though they didn't have all the means that the North did, did they try to keep the records as well as the, uh, the North did in the South? Each of you? Uh, you well, I, I know um, in one interesting example, I, I really, I'm actually working on my second book on the South right now, but what Joseph Jones is, is, is who I did my um, thesis on 10 years ago, and he goes to Washington for the trial of Henry Wirtz. Um, there had been some claims that the doctors went into Andersonville and purposely inoculated them, the, the um, soldiers with gangrene and scrofula and syphilis, and so he went to answer that charge, and they didn't, um, is best to my knowledge, but they, he, was, he went for a tour of the Army Medical Museum. He was so shocked at, at, the, at the fact that the Northern doctors had produced this enterprise uh, during the war. They, they, they didn't come into the war any less um, efficacious. They had, some of them had studied together in the North or, or in Europe. They just struggled with lack of resources. And it was so where you could have a very structured union military hospital with um, hospital stewards and convalescents nursing. In the south, you would still see female nurses, but you might also see them serving alongside, alongside um, uh, refugees or slaves or freedmen or um, wise women or eclectics. It was just they, they had to you know, use the resources that they had, which were few. Few, much fewer than the North, but um, still some interesting and important developments came out of the South. South. And Guild was one of those? That Guild, Hunter McGuire, mm -hmm. who was personal McGuire surgeon at Jackson. Who wrote as well. Uh, and there was a surgeon, I can't think of his name, right off the bat, who ran the hospital department during the Atlanta campaign in 64, and he had to keep, he called them flying hospitals, he had to keep moving these hospitals because the North was pressing them down in. Mm -hmm. And the South, the South, what did they use when they ran out of silk? They used horsehair for suture material. To make it pliable so you could tie it, they boiled it. Duh, maybe these wounds aren't as infectious as others. They also started using herbal medicines. They couldn't get these heavy metals that the North was, so they started using, uh, reading Indian lore and, and herbal medicines, which weren't as bad, some of these things, as Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Uh, once said, or senior, said, uh, the Army, U.S. Army pharmacopoeia, pharmacopoeia should be thrown in the ocean. It would be good for mankind, but it would be detrimental to the fish. <laughs> And they, there's a Francis Pierre Porche actually comes up with this 700 page book and it's all about dif different indigenous remedies that they pioneer to treat disease which yeah as, as Gordon says were in, in a lot of cases not as harmful. Mm -hmm. So you still see it's just different you don't see um, medicine developing necessarily on a national basis in the same way you do through the Army Medical Museum but individual physicians um, are given orders by more. Jones is one, uh, Richard Bolton's another one, um, and it's, you know, conduct experiments here and see if we can figure out um, some treatment to help our soldiers. You know, here they had all these bodies and all these wounds and men before them, and they knew they were going to get knowledge from this, and they were, as you say, they were preparing it, and circular number two got it to, to where it had to be, the Army Museum, uh, Medical Museum. Did they ever worry that they're, that these are not people anymore. These are experiments that I'm doing. I'm going to learn a lot from here through these bodies and these people uh, and their wounds. Did they ever worry that they were both dead and alive or kind of 
experimenting on people or that they didn't expect to do? I always got the sense um, from my doctors that when looking at the Civil War doctors, they absolutely did care about the patients. I mean, really, they did. And I know that in chapter three of my book, I do talk about a situation where Benjamin Woodward does inoculate a so-called healthy wound with gangrenous matter to see if it will develop. And he, he in his case, he truly believes in, in the efficacy of bromine and um, now, this is before Claude Bernard's sort of treaty on the ethics of experimentation becomes known. And there was this sort of idea if we self experiment, there's, you know, it somehow makes some of these experiments more acceptable. Um, they, they do are conscious of it. And a lot of times you hear them say, if we can figure this out, it will help the larger body of soldiers. Um, but I did notice with the specimen histories that through the war, doctors increasingly start to speak in a, in a more scientifically structured rhetoric about the body and it was it was less you know john brown from you know illinois regiment number i <laughs> it was now i'm giving you the tibia the you know his ilium his you know to, so that i can show the effects and these kegs are appearing in their body parts and they're numbered so and now you might just argue that medicine itself is becoming more scientific, which naturally leads to a little bit of distance with the patients, but I don't think they were willfully, I think the, the underlying goal was always to help the yeah, troops, help return them. them to the fronts, and or would you agree? Yeah, well, I think the, the Civil War surgeon, both North and South, uh, wasn't a sawbones or a bloodthirsty ghoul. He was there to help people. Now there might be a certain percentage uh, Letterman talks about contract surgeons. He had no really love for contract surgeons who would come after a battle and they would be signed up by the government to work for a few weeks and help out. And he said some of these were there stare to get some practice, uh, surgical practice. But uh, most, all, I would say 95% of the surgeons in both armies were, were there to help uh, their patients. You know, today we're battling in hospitals, MRSA, and uh, my brother-in-law contracted that in a hospital, and it's and it's there. It is. What diseases in the Civil War hospitals were they most worried about that that uh, would infect or whatever the body? Uh, and were there any more specifically American diseases that you maybe didn't see out in the Crimea War? Well, probably the one that they've dreaded most was gangrene, mm -hmm. erysipelas pyemia, which is blood poisoning. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would hit, I mean, it would just take over a war. And they didn't know the reason it was being spread, it's a certain bacterium that causes that, but the surgeon's hands. He was, going to, he was contacting a, a gangrenous wound, looking at it, trying to help the patient, but without washing and think, go to another one. And then this is being spread, uh, but they started figuring this out. As, as Sean had points out in her book, they said, well, maybe we should put these people in a certain ward. Number one, they wanted it there because of the smell. Mm -hmm. Gangrene is, if, once you smell it, you always know it's going to be there. You, you never forget it. But that was the, starting to isolate these cases. They also isolated smallpox. They started isolating these cases in different wards. And they found in these that, hospitals. Had, that helped overall then. But they still did not know the root cause, which is a bacteria, and then that knowledge didn't come to mankind until Lister and Pasteur and other people in Europe. And but there, there's one interesting story. You mentioned Oliver Wendell Holmes earlier. He actually um, is one of those elite American physicians that had been to Europe that you know uh, was really a, a, a leader of American medical doctors. And just 10 years before the war, he actually referenced um, Ignac Semmelweis's work, who was a brilliant uh, physician from Vienna, who actually made the link that his students were somehow passing purpural fever or purpural perionitis between the maternity or the autopsy room and the maternity ward. So he said, I noticed that if they disinfect their hands and disinfect their body, that these um, incidences of uh, transference are, are drastically and abruptly removed. Um, he dies alone, I, I think, insane in a mental hospital somewhere. Nobody buys his findings. Oliver Wendell Holmes actually su suggests that there might be some credence to these claims and says, I mind, and he makes a joke of it, but he said, I might as well have, 
you know, left the country because they wanted to deport me after I said that. I mean, the, the mere mention of contagion was so controversial. So if you skip forward just 12, 12, 13 years, during the war, not only are they talking about Semmelweis, they're publishing these findings, they're, they're suggesting that, you know, these, we are, and the same, um, one of the same strains causing erysipelas causes purple perinitis. So they're saying medical attendants are, have to disinfect. We have to give each patient their own sponge. We've got to make sure that you know we're putting chloride of soda everywhere. And it wasn't just disinfectant disinfectants in the environment to remove the smell. It was there was a new discussion about what are we what are these disinfectants doing? What are they actually killing? What is in the environment? Are there cells and animalcules? So the just 12 years it and the conversation becomes radically different. Um, so it just gives you a sense of you know how sort of important the war was for giving the physicians the experience to see what they had only read about before.